Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to The Take Up. Today we have episode 115, Supply and Setup Showdown. All right, good afternoon, folks. Welcome into the show. It is time for The Take Up, and hopefully we'll have a little bit of fun today. Thinking about this is a fairly short show. I know I say that pretty frequently and still go the full length, but I wanted this to just be a little bit of fun. I'm hoping we get some of you guys who are in here watching live to chime in. And if you have a chance, please do chime in, be live, be participating, be in the comments, and go ahead and say your piece about the things that you see people fight about in the industry boards. Here's the thing. After having been online for some time as an industry educator, as somebody who's teaching machine embroidery, having gone to lots of shows, having talked to lots of folks, having seen people who have different educational backgrounds, different backgrounds in embroidery, different ways that they do things, I have been around for a lot of little fights. <laughs> and honestly, a lot of these little fights don't mean what we think they mean. And I'll probably get into that a lot. But I don't want to completely get away from the topic and say that I'm not going to talk about disagreements that people have with this stuff. But the kind of showdowns I'm talking about, this is not necessarily me saying I've tested the best things and I'm going to tell you exactly what works. What I'm going to talk about are the kind of fights people have and how I think, honestly, a lot of these are a little false. They're a little weird. They're not exactly fights at all. But we are going to talk about many ways so I can kind of discuss some of the things that people do. There are, you know, maybe a little weird, maybe a little disagreeable, but honestly, usually not the problem at all. So we're going to talk about some of these things, and I would like to have you chime in. What are the vice that you see in the industry all the time? What are the kinds of things that people discuss with you? How do you come across, like, different sorts of educational ways people do things, different sorts of ways that people do things in setup, supplies, how they handle their embroidery? That's the kind of stuff we're going to talk about today. So this is really about those showdowns that happen in that. Um, as you guys know, it is sometimes very busy. There are sometimes some uh, technical difficulties we have. So I don't have quite as much material as I would like to as far as showing you more of these things, having visual aids. Some of it's going to be just us gabbing, but hopefully you'll have some things to discuss as far as some of these topics go. Because we have lots of things that people talk about. And like I said, these things are constantly coming up. We're on a constant cycle, especially in like the embroidery groups, in the embroidery boards, when we talk about these things at shows, where we have these discussions as to what matters, what makes a difference to our eventual outcome and to our businesses. So we've got stabilizer showdowns. What do people do with stabilizing, hooping? How do people handle different stitch types and what does it mean to what things cost? What's going on in your marketing and your business models? There's all sorts of things that people do in this, in this kind of cycle of fighting over things or discussing things or honestly, usually coming with two different opposing viewpoints and like I said, opposing viewpoints that often have to do with what type of results you're trying to get. So like I said, I thought it'd be fun to mess around with this topic, talk about it a little bit, talk about the things that I see people fight about and, you know, play up the versus mindset, fight. We're going to get these things together and talk about them. But the truth of the matter is most of these things aren't a fight. Most of these things have to do with what someone's trying to achieve in a particular way, what their market is, what the apparel they're embroidering on, what their technique is trying to achieve. And if I have anything to say about it, the first thing I'm going to say is this. Results matter. There are many different ways to skin any of these cats, whether we're talking about how we digitize, we're talking about how we apply our materials, we're talking about what hoops we use, what equipment we use, what materials we use, and how we employ them. There are different ways to achieve results, and not all results are the same. And not all results are equally desirable to all people. So like I said, get in the comments, talk about this with me. I'd like to see where you have these discussions, but I'll go ahead and share one particular story that was early on in my career when I started making small run patches that always kind of, I center back on this thing to remind myself how you can really make problems for yourself by not understanding the goal that's at hand, right? When I first started making small run patches, I was teaching people how to make fairly pliable patches, patches that have... Uh, not very much support material. They're meant to be stitched on. They were never going to be used with heat adhesive. I was not going to heat press these things on. I was specifically making patches to sew on that was specifically made for like apparel that is being used on screen. And in the case of the original pieces I was doing when I started teaching this stuff, they were meant to look like they had been worn. They were meant to look like they had a little time on them, a little age on them. They didn't, the idea was never to have crispy, brand new, off the card, factory made patches, 
because they were supposed to look like they had been on a person in use. You didn't want everyone on screen to look like they were immediately coming off of the brand new rack, opening everything out of the package because it looks weird. You know, that's not the point. So I made these patches that were fairly thin. They were fairly uh, flexible. They were made entirely out of twill on water-soluble stabilizer. They did not have any applied materials like crinolines or buckrams or anything of that nature. They're very thin. And it's how I learned how to make patches. It's how I taught how to make patches when people first asked me because I taught off of my production line. I was never making a project specifically to teach it. I was making projects for my production line and then teaching the methods I learned as I made them. That's how I came into the industry, especially how I came to education. And one of the people who first came to me and discussed stuff with me was asking about this process and said, you know, I like your process and I'm getting a much cleaner edge from it, but I don't get how you don't, how are you going to get stiff patches? And when I talked to him about it, I'm like, all right, well, yeah, how stiff do you want them? What are you looking for? So I talked about the traditional conventional maze of making patches. I talked about crinoline. I talked about, you know, adding support materials. I talked about adding uh, heat seal adhesive. And it turns out this guy was making patches and what his market was. And this is described by him. So if you're in this market, and you don't think it's the same for your market. He said, all right, these guys are putting them on their battle vest. These are death metal and metalhead patches. That's all they want. And all they want are stiff patches. These things need to be hard like cardboard. These things need to be absolutely stiff. They need to slam in like a piece of cardboard. They need to be hard. You put them in an envelope and you can't bend the envelope when you ship them. And so I'm looking at this guy and I'm like, you know what? The thing is, I'm not doing something wrong. You're not doing something wrong. The reason why you're applying three layers of material to it and gluing it all together and sewing this stuff, you know, post is because frankly, your care your people have that character they want the patches to have they want them to be hard if the patches aren't stiff like armor they're unhappy if my people who i was giving these pat patches to to sew on for wardrobe had gotten patches that were absolutely stiff like cardboard and hard and deadly they would have hated those patches we had two different goals what was the point of all, of all this story is that results matter and your audience matters if the audience for what you want desire something that is unconventional then someone's conventional rules or the way that they want to apply materials doesn't make sense for you i will say this though just in the same vein of saying why results matter this is why people do respond to questions with kind of regularized standardized versions of techniques because the techniques are likely to work under most circumstances why do i usually recommend embroidery specific materials for everything when like we're talking about patches again the plastic patch method where you can stitch through something uh, plastic and tear it away there you know i always say there's the walmart kind of method where you can do it out of vinyl but that's still a purchase of material and there are some people who are out there uh recycling you know bags from mattresses bags for furniture packing uh dry cleaning bags all sorts of other plastics to make them well Yes, they might work out. I don't know what material those bags are made out of. If I have to teach the thing, I'm going to give you something standardized because results matter. For me, I want to make sure that whatever I teach you is going to prevent you know, issues from happening while you're running so that you don't wonder whether you did something wrong and it happens to be a materials problem. That's why we get standardized versions of stuff. And honestly, that's where some of these fights come from. So what we end up having often in these discussions are not really clashes, right? They're not really clashes. I mean, I know I'm being funny and I'm going to throw up the versus graphic over and over while we're talking about this stuff, but they're really not clashes the way we think they are. Most of the time when we have these clashes, it's because we actually have different goals or because one embroidery design, one piece of apparel isn't like another. They're not all the same. Not all jobs are the same. And most definitely not all clientels, not all segments are the same. So that's what this is. And we're going to talk more about that, including some things that I like to discuss as far as conflict resolution. You guys have heard me talk about principle of charity before. I'm actually going to bring up another article that I wrote, an older article, once again, to kind of give you the concepts I have for listening to people when you are discussing these things and how we deal with these arguments and why we can deal with them better and learn from them better if we apply a couple principles to them. We'll talk about that first. I want to say hi to some folks and get some comments, and then we'll jump into some of these fights. And I cannot wait to hear from you guys how you feel about some of these uh, big versus battles with machine embroidery materials and execution. So we'll talk about that as we get going. 
First thing we have Sally coming in saying, good evening. Good evening, Sally. Happy to have you in. Yost is in saying, hi, all. Happy to have you in as well. All the way from Sweden. Ramona's in with her new show tomorrow. So Conversations and Coffee, check out Ramona tomorrow. I believe that is 10 a.m. Central Time. Feel free to put that link in the description in the comments. Ramona talking also about embroidery stuff. She did bobbins last week. And I guess tomorrow's needles. So jump in with Ramona tomorrow. Mike is in saying, hola, hola, Mike. Happy to have you in. Frank from the UK saying, good evening. Thank you for always being an awesome supporter and community sharer. So Frank doing great stuff and running his own group. So I'm sure you've seen topics like this a million times. How do we fight in the groups? Uh, Mike saying, this topic attacks me personally, changed my mind. Hey, I know this is rough. I, I have been in groups since back in the day in email groups, but before Google groups was Google groups. When we were on email chains, debating how to do things, debating how to digitize certain things, debating how to apply materials, what needles to use. These fights have been going on forever. Realistically, they're not the fights that people think they are. Often what happens is you have a favorite expert. I'd love to believe for some of you guys that's me, but I don't flatter myself. You have an expert that taught you something, you used what they taught you, and you got results. And once you got results, you feel like, bam, I got it. It locked me in. Maybe they stopped me from having a problem that was going on. This must be the way. This is the way. We are going to do it this way forever. And someone comes to you with a brand new way of doing something, a different way of doing something. And unless it is, and pardon me, unless it's asinine, unless somebody absolutely has something off the wall that is not going to function in the world of physics, they may have something they're doing differently that's still providing them with a result they're happy with. And it doesn't always feel good because sometimes we feel like our expert helped us out and taught us. And we want to get those industry standard ways of doing things out there. I know I'm one of them. I standardize things to make sure they work. But there are ways things work. And like I said, I'm with you, man. I feel attacked sometimes when I get into these things because personally, I've been the guy before who says, come on, what, what are you doing with that stabilizer? What are you doing with that? I've felt that way, but I learned over the years that results matter and that people get results in different ways. So let's go ahead and grab a couple more. Uh, Matt says, I'm always late. Don't worry. We're just having a fun discussion today. This is not as much an educational piece as much as we're just going to talk about some different you know, results ways people discuss things, how people fight about stuff. And honestly, I'm looking for you guys to get in the comments and share your opinions on this stuff. So for sure, let's talk about it. And hey, man. <laughs> hey, Matt. Yes, is in there saying, uh, same as screen print and perfect white. Yeah, go. that's how the topic goes best. Uh, yeah, soft war. Yeah, for sure. For sure. It's just the same way with density and underlay. We have this discussion all the time. I tend to run lighter densities, especially when I'm doing finished goods, when it's not a patch, when it's not outerwear. I tend to run lighter densities because the hand of a garment is important to me. I want to use more underlay, less density in the top stitching to get my full coverage. Also, if you look at things like how things are run for home decor, go look at home decor pillows. Go look at curtains and see how much coverage things have. Absolute perfect coverage that doesn't show any material through is not always the goal for all embroidery. So if we say the proper density for 40 weight thread is always, you know, four points or 0.4 mils, or if we go even higher, there's a lot of people who go 3.6 or 0.36 mils or more. If we say that is density for full coverage without t talking about what material it's going on and what market it's for, we're kind of not really telling the truth. We are giving you one version of what things are. It's why whenever I teach I teach classes, and somebody says, give me the numbers for how wide a satin stitch can be forever. Give me the numbers for the proper density for this thread forever. I give them the numbers and then tell them the non-answer answer, which everybody hates and loves at the same time if they know what it, what it means, which is go and test it yourself. Make a swatch chart. Find out what it means to you to have that density and how it feels. By the way, test it on different materials because it's not going to be the same throughout. So that's how it is. Uh, Mike's got one. Let's talk about this. All right. Before we even get into it, we're going to have a versus fight right here. Uh, I love having spirited debates about different ways to do things from stabilizers uh, to pre versus self wound bobbins. What I have trouble respecting is somebody thinks there's only one right way to do any of this. There's so many ways to get that result. 100% Mike, you get the gold star right out of the gate. The truth of the matter is I have done all of the above. And what I found early on when I first started teaching, and it wasn't just commercial work, when I started teaching people who were not just in the commercial sphere, when I started having people who were in the home sphere, that's when I started learning early that there were divisions that would pop up that didn't make a ton of sense to me because I found that I could get results using different methods, using home methods, using commercial methods. And you guys know, I started on a multi-head machines exclusively. I didn't run a single head until I was already digitizing. So 
I was not a single needle guy. I often looked at that and honestly, because they were so slow, especially when I first started, I had a hard time looking at those seriously. Then I saw people running businesses using a uh, home and prosumer equipment and they were making it work and they had reasons why. Uh, there's a lot that goes into this stuff. And frankly, embroidery is embroidery to a degree. Does equipment matter? Yes. Can I make roughly the same commercial logo on home equipment, on different stabilizers, on commercial equipment, faster, slower, different thread types, different stitch types? Absolutely, I can. There's a million ways to make a mark on a garment with thread, and we can explore all of them. Plus, you close yourself off to interesting different topics and different things that you could be doing if you just say no before you look at it. Open mind, open heart when we talk about this stuff. I think that's the way it is. So that's how it is. <laughs> All right. So I'm with Matt on this one, too. I had a very similar experience. Matthew says, my first digitizing made a single layer of cotton twill patches tougher than a plate of M1 Abrams composite armor. That is the best way of saying bulletproof I've heard in a long time, Matt. Uh, what I'll say also, uh, my first time digitizing and the first design I ever did, I had my stitch length for all of my fills. Yes, all of my fills at one millimeter. One millimeter stitch length for all of my fills and the entire hat design was packed so full of stitches that it likewise would have stopped a switchblade uh, thrown from across the room. It was absolutely bulletproof. It was definitely there as some sort of personal protection for the center of your head and not a design. These things happen. <laughs> but I'll say this, funny enough, I guess if I would have been in the uh, battle vest patch making arena, I would have been better off than if I had made my usual loose and blousy fashion embroidery that is so uh, pliable as to be quite soft. Apparently not the way to go for one particular person's market, right? That's how it goes. Uh, Cindy says, good afternoon, late too. Don't worry about it. We're just having a chat today. We're just going to have some fun talking about uh, perceived controversies in the embroidery world. Mike says, right, it's impossible to say what's the best because best means something different to everybody. And here, I'll, once again, we'll just make the point. What's best for home decor? What's best for bridal? What's best for children's wear? What's best for business to business? What's best for boutique fashion? These are very different types of embroidery and they don't stand up to the same rigors. They don't necessarily have to. They don't need to be the same rubric. If I am grading, let's talk about the language. If I'm grading language, if I'm grading your writing for something personal versus something technical versus something creative, I have different standards I need someone to meet. At the same time, we're all speaking the same language. These things are mutually intelligible, but they don't have the same standards as to whether or not they're achieving their goal. The goals differ, which means the means differ. And it means the execution can be different. You have to think about that, really. I don't know. It's hard to, it's hard to get there and say, you know, my way might not be the only way. Hey, my way is not the only way. Whenever somebody comes to me and says, another educator said this, I'm like, try both and see which one works for you. Uh, only you can decide what works on your machines and only you can make the decision. Well, also your customer, only you in concert with your customer can decide what's valuable and what they want to continue on using for sure. So yeah, something to remember. Yeah, The best is different for everybody. You're correct, Mike. Absolutely the case. Uh, Ramona, by the way, has shared her link. Go check that out. Check out her live stream tomorrow and check out the previous live stream she did starting off her show. Everybody's voice is welcome out here, folks. Tom, a Buzzard Bay Embroidery from North Carolina. Tom Fire, happy to have you in. By the way, a source of all kinds of excellent information and inspiration. Tom, who has done stuff, by the way, in different ways that not everybody does too. Uh, done a lot of cool experimental stuff and made cool products out of it. So that's the thing. Not one way is the right way all the time. We have to try that. And yeah, Matthew says that is heresy. Absolutely. I will be burned in effigy because I'm one of the first people who will stop and say, Here's my way, but somebody else's way may work for you. I have reasons why I do things the way I do them, and I'll talk about the reasons why I do things the way I do them. It doesn't mean they're always right. But like I said, it's why I think it's funny when we get into these like, boom, versus battles. What's the right way versus the wrong way? What's the right stabilizer versus the wrong stabilizer? Whatever these versus battles are, my thing is, if I look at your embroidery at the end of the day and your embroidery looks good, the results prove out. I can't say that that's bad. If it looks good, feels good to the person who's going to wear it, they spent money on it, they're happy with it, you're happy with it, machine's still safe and sound, nothing broke, or at least didn't break so bad you couldn't fix it. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, I have to say, there are things we can judge. Right and wrong, good and bad are a little hard. If it fulfills the need 
and it doesn't cause any harm, it's really hard for me to say that's the wrong way of doing things. I have absolutely seen people doing things I thought were awful. In fact, I'll, I'll put one up that actually challenged the heck out of me. I saw somebody who was running knit hats, and instead of using stabilizer, they were using paper towel and then tearing it away and washing away some fibers. It's still, to this day, I can't make myself do it. I can't make myself look at it. I still want to use stabilizer instead. I'm like, man, there must be a product for this that's better than that. But if you asked me with a gun to my head, did the result that was on the actual piece look okay? It did. It looked fine. There was nothing wrong with the embroidery itself. Uh, I want to find a good reason why you should never try this. Aside from just the fact that I'm assuming it might be pretty linty, depending on the paper towel in question, I don't recommend it. I'm not telling you you should go do it. I think the reason why we, like I said, once again, re, why do we use standardized materials is because we reasonably know how they're going to react to the work. And if you reasonably know how they're going to react to the work and they are uniformly made and intended for the purpose, you're likely to get results without a bunch of futzing around and trials. At the same time, if I looked at those hats, I could not tell you for certain. Once they were all stitched up, once everything was together, the designs were such that they weren't causing too much stress on things. It literally just had to hold in place long enough to stitch. They looked okay. I cannot lie to you and say they didn't look okay. I will fully admit to my massive discomfort with watching it happen. <laughs> but the truth is, if the results are good for you, it's really hard to say it's wrong. And especially when some of some of the things we're talking about aren't even wild as using, you know, random materials that don't belong under your machine. They're not even that wild. It's more just using materials in a different way than I do or than someone else does. Are there goals and results that I'm looking for? Absolutely. It is It is so hard. Yeah, and Ahmed says this. I've seen something very similar before. Yeah, I have seen people using old yellow pages and newspaper. I have seen the same thing. I don't like it. It leaves a lot of fibers. I think it looks cruddy. I don't like it. It's not my attitude of, of what I would do correctly. And old yellow pages or old newspapers have, you know, carbon black inks in them. I wouldn't do that. Um, what I am going to say is sometimes if you look at the embroidery and it looks good, the methods are different. I don't like to use non-standard embroidery materials. What I will say is using a different stabilizer than I use or a different amount of stabilizer than I use. Those are the kinds of things that are hard for me to just call you out and say no. And what I want to say is this. Let, I'm going to bring this up really quickly and I know be the big buzzkill and not do the fun stuff. I mean, yes, I know everybody's ready for more versus battles, but at the same time, I'm going to bring something up that is slightly less of that nature real quick and just kind of put it in front of you to say, hey, you know, here, here's what we're looking at. This is what I'm talking about. And it is this. It is the principles of charity and humanity. I'm going to show them briefly and just talk about it. So, like I said, this is the article you can get to. I'm putting it up on the screen now. Here's the bit.ly link for that. If you want to stop and check this out in a second, feel free to stop and check it out here. I'm going to do this too. We'll go ahead and take the banner down for you. If you're watching this with your phone in your hand and you want to read this article later, pause the video, grab this QR code, and you'll be taking to the link for the article I'm going to talk about. All right. So with that out of the way, you can go back, check that off of the stream later on the Replay Squad. We'll go ahead and put this up. This is the article I'm referring to. And it's actually a rewritten version of an article I've written more than once because people often have these kind of discussions with people. And usually it's something that's more contentious than what we're talking about today, where they get mad at someone else. A lot of the times this is stuff like politics. I'm not going to talk about politics because I value your time and mine. We don't need to talk about politics. What I will talk about is the fact that, uh, you know, we have issues of communication. And frankly, some of the issues we have stem from not thinking of the other party as being rational or humane or thinking about what they're doing with kind of these principles in mind. So the two principles I'm going to talk about are the principle of charity and the principle of humanity. So uh, the principle of charity suggests that when you're evaluating a speaker's statements, you take the strongest, most rational interpretation of their position. So principle of charity says what? Instead of thinking like, all right, you tell me that I use, you know, yellow pages for my stabilizer. I don't go, oh, that's because, you know, they're, they're trying to make something cheap that specifically is going to chew up a machine. I'm not going to think about some sort of conspiracy theory to explain it. I'm not going to try and put malice behind it. I'm not going to assume that the reason somebody's doing that is because they're trying to do something bad that they're hiding. Principle of charity when we're having this argument is just to say, all right, I'm going to assume the best version of that. I'm not going to try and make the interpretation bad. So the principle of charity says, take the best version of your opponent's argument and make that what you're arguing against. 
like when you're talking about it, when you're having that discussion, go, all right, I'm going to take the best version, not the worst, craziest version that this could be. So principle of charity, you don't just dismantle their argument by making it into the worst version of itself that you can. Uh, principle of humanity is a slightly different thing. I'll bring the article back up for us. So principle of humanity, slightly different thing. Uh, as, to assume that the speaker's statements are grounded in their beliefs, their understanding of reality, and that if in a similar situation as they are, you as the listener might think or feel similarly. Assume that if you felt the same things they did, if you came from the same background they did, if you had the same experience they did, and you were sitting in the same place they were, you're standing in their shoes, that you might also take the same attitude toward what they're doing or what they're thinking. So that's that. That's the two things I just want to put in front of you. Principle of charity, principle of humanity. Yeah, you know me. I'm going to go a little thinky and talk about something slightly more than stabilizers and embroidery stuff today. However, I always do. Uh, principle of charity, principle of humanity. Apply those to things, including business. Yes, I know. Business. We're talking about business here. Are we talking about business? We're talking about business. Charity and humanity, it helps you to resolve conflicts better if you don't think the person who's debating something with you or, hey, the person who's refusing your order, the person who's fighting with you over a check, whatever it is, if you don't assume that they're a villain, an inhuman villain who is here to ruin your day, the chances are you're going to have better chances of understanding them and you may be able to find common ground so you can have the discussion that you need to have and arrive somewhere more useful. So once again, that's the article that's here. I'm not saying everybody's going to go for that. We're not all going to read that stuff. But if you want to read it, if you want to see about kind of a little bit of conflict resolution in business and what we can do to make things a little better on that score, here's the link one more time. That's the bit.ly a bit.ly slash h-u-m-c-h-a-r that's all you need to know and if you are watching this with your phone in your hand and you are on the replay squad we will just go ahead and give you the qr code up in the corner for a second here we are one more time qr codes everywhere scan it and <laughs> get it in go ahead and read that at your leisure the reason why i bring that up is i think that it is one of the most wonderful things we can do for ourselves is to put ourselves in someone else's position. It opens our minds up. It allows us to have these discussions without necessarily discrediting someone. And it lets us see what they're seeing as far as what those results are, what they're getting, what they want, and have some better understanding and at least some uh, some chance to take that opinion into heart and to understand something that's coming from it. And I'll say, like I said, for me, one of those first big fights was looking at people who are doing like fiber arts and craft versions of embroidery versus commercial embroidery. And all my commercial people are like, throw that out. That is useless. Why are you looking at that? Whereas I started looking at saying, Hey, we're all making marks with thread. We're all trying to make designs happen. Why can't we learn from these things? And the same way on the other direction, I was telling people about commercial stuff that are telling me in the home market, why would you do this? Why would you do all this stuff? Who cares about these efficiencies? And I'm like, hey, you want more time to make more stuff. You want it to run quicker. You want it to run reliably. You don't want to worry about registration or corrections. Some of the efficiencies and the things we do in the commercial world to make things run right the first time might be worthwhile to you, if nothing else, to save you time so you can do more creative things with your time or so that you get the results you expect to get instead of just kind of throwing things at the wall, which is what a lot of market was doing. Uh, commercial market at the time, I saw a lot of people not using a lot of imagination. They weren't trying new things. They weren't experimenting. They weren't doing the good work that Tom's out there doing right now, trying to show us cool stuff. Uh, but they also, uh, I was seeing people in the home market who were thinking of what we do in the commercial market as overkill or difficult or too much faffing about with technical knowledge. And they were doing really cool creative work, but they weren't getting the technical results that I think they could have gotten. And actually, once I finally started dabbling with single needle machines, could get by understanding some of the basics and the foundational information. So it was just interesting. Plus, hey, folks, you got to remember, if you're doing this for a career where you're getting paid all day to do it, you have different motivations than somebody who's doing it in the you know hour they have in their day that's free between work and kids and stuff. I mean, that is a very different kind of time scale you have to work on it depending on how you're making your money. So you got to think about that. These are, these are real things. Hobbyists may not have the time 
to dedicate to things that sometimes we do commercially for problem solving. And commercial people may not have the time or the willingness to allow things to have a bunch of color changes and other stuff in it to get one creative result when they have to make thousands of pieces. The motivations are different. The people are coming from different places. If we understand that, we can look at different things that people do and know why they're getting there. And including things that I consider uh, wrongheaded in, in technique. I can say, looking at how you're doing it, I know why. We always talk, we joke around about big complex fills with a lot of holes in them. People take a logo, they pull it in from SVG, they grab it and they go, okay, bottom start, top end, 45 degree angle. And here we go. One big fill at one angle to fill a really complex shape. And I'm like, why aren't they cutting that apart? And I'm like, well, if you're someone who doesn't know where to make those decisions, or you don't have any time to spend doing that technical work, you just want to get to the embroidery, but you do have a limitation as to getting these things done, or you want to do your own digitizing, from that level of understanding, or if you're literally just not sure artistically how to break everything up, you're going to do that kind of work. That's the first thing you understand is that, okay, I have a shape, it needs stitches, I put stitches in the shape. I might not like that as my first way to, you know, make marks with embroidery. It doesn't mean that that person's necessarily a villain who's trying to make embroidery worse for the world. That is somebody who is trying to make embroidery and their first thought is, hey, if this were in Photoshop and I was filling this with a bucket fill, I would click in this area and it would fill with color and that's what I want, just stitches. That's not evil. That's just not the way embroidery works for me. It's not what I think is the best kind of embroidery. So it's still, it's how it goes, folks. All right, so we have a couple more things going on I would like to show here. Matt says, I use the Tyvek mailers from US Postal Services Stabilizer because I ran out. I've done some cool stitching on Tyvek. Tyvek's cool because it holds up to a lot of work. I made a bunch of cool wallets with Tyvek, and my actually my mom did a bunch of that. She does cool crafts, and she was a seamstress back in the day. Her term, not mine, so sewist, if you prefer, is totally fine. She said seamstress, so that's what I always remember first. Um, but yeah. Made really cool Tyvek envelopes. Also, they held up really well to being colored with permanent marker. As a craft object, very cool. But honestly, I've seen Tyvek envelopes done printed for a retail sales. So they're cool. But yeah, <laughs> Mike says, of course, it's the quicker pucker upper. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I don't think that, <laughs> that you get a lot of stabilization. Here's the thing that I say about the, the paper towel stabilizer. Why I don't love that idea at all. Uh, stabilizer is supposed to provide what? Stability, dimensional stability, so that nothing stretches overly much in any one given direction. That's also why wet laid fiber is how it is, or why when we use woven stabilizer that's even woven, that we have to have one at 45 and one at 135, we have to set them at angles to each other so that we have all the different angles covered for stretch and pucker. Uh, that's because we're trying to get dimensional stability. Paper tears out too quickly. Paper towel doesn't hold up to much at all. I think it was kind of there as a placeholder. The kind of work that the person was doing who was doing that hooping, I think they might have gotten away with using almost nothing, or they could have definitely used a very light layer of tear away if they didn't really want any stability after the fact. Uh, probably would have been better, could have run faster, who knows. But yeah, uh, Matt says, worked great, pretty well for a free stabilizer that can be shipped to your door for free. That's not technically how that works. I'm not going to call you out, but I think you're going to get uh, your own verses from the U.S. Postal Service. You keep using their free free mailers as stabilizer. Uh, this show does not approve of that usage. <laughs> Sorry, U.S. Postal Service. <laughs> all right. So let's go to a couple of these things that I wanted to talk about. So, all right. Stabilizer showdown. What's our first verses, right? First verses for me. So here's the big one that I'm, I want to talk about. Versus, what's the battle for me? Uh, first one is this, minimal versus multiple layers of stabilizer. Uh, I come down in the minimal stabilizer crew. For me, if I can help it, I'm trying to use one piece of almost anything. Do I use two pieces at when necessary? Absolutely. I absolutely think that is something that you should do. However, I'm trying to use the least amount of stabilizer possible, whereas I know lots of folks who use more stabilizers and I understand what they're doing. A lot of the times they're using it for different kinds of stability. They're using a cutaway to get dimensional stability. They're using a tearaway to try and hold crisp edges. They're trying to really provide a tight material that's going to hold the edges crisply and to almost do sometimes what edge run underlay does, it seems to me when they describe it. Uh, I have used both and tried it. I don't like multiple layers of stabilizer any more than I have to. Um, I will sometimes do something people don't like. And here's the thing. I'm on the same boat with a lot of you guys. I do something different. And I think I just saw this in the comments. I'll have to jump up. 
Uh, I will sometimes use adhesives. I will stick something down and people don't like that because it's extra processing and potentially nasty. It potentially can be dirty. So that's the thing. Minimal versus multiple stabilizer. That's the big versus I hear a lot of the time because for me, it's like one layer of medium cutaway does a lot of work. If I'm on anything that is performance wear, I'm thinking no show poly mesh. I'm thinking maybe we do action back, but if you're doing action back or woven stabilizers, as you know, you need two pieces to cover all the angles, but that's still minimal to me because two pieces of that is minimal it's the minimal amount i need to make that stuff happen but i've known people who go like two layers cut of medium cutaway one layer of tear away for christmas and then they're using topping on everything for me i use minimal materials in general so that means uh, low stitch counts if I can get it. And that's not just for efficiency's sake. I tend to be somebody who also, like I said, I like the light hand more than the coverage. I will give up a little bit of coverage to get a light hand. That is not for everybody. That is not for every customer either. I've had customers come to me and tell me, especially white on black, that's the big one. White on black, you are not getting enough coverage. I need to see more coverage. I don't want any of that background showing through. Then I got to work on that. But for me, minimal versus multiple, I come down to the minimal squad. I want the least amount of stabilizer I can get in a piece. Where do I vary on this? Uh, hats, and we'll talk about that again in a second. Hats, I use stabilizer more than other people do uh, because a lot of people don't use stabilizer in uh, structured hats, and we'll talk about that. But when I use uh, stabilizers in general and toppings, we'll talk about toppings. I don't call those stabilizers. They are toppings for me because, I mean, I usually want to make sure we're talking about dimensional stab stability. But for me, minimal stabilizer on the back is the way to go. I don't want the credit card. I don't want the hard feel. I want soft embroidery. Like I said, not every person. I thought that was a, a universal goal and it's not. Had this happen to me also talking about screen print. There was a, a short period of time, a couple of years back, where a bunch of the screen printers were really favoring a heavy plasticky feel, where when I came into the business, all the screen printers were trying to do was to reduce the amount of plastisol on that shirt. So they had a very light hand and then they were moving to water-based inks to get that light. So I come from the light hand squad. I also had to do a lot of work. There was a period of time where burnouts and tissue tees were being embroidered against all odds and against all reason. And so I had to learn how to do some really light work to get that stuff to get done and to have very light stabilization so you couldn't see through all of it or not as much as you do when you don't use that kind of stuff. So yeah, minimal versus multiple. I'm gonna go ahead and say, yep, that's me. I'm on the minimal squad. That's how it's gonna be with the versus for me. But that doesn't mean it has to be for you. Uh, and when we're talking about toppings, water soluble toppings, I am actually in the middle on this one. If something has texture and that includes most like rib knit garments, if it's a piquet polo, if it's got a basket weave, I'm going to use one layer of water soluble topping on top. I used it a lot. However, here's the other difference. Why your setup matters, why your shop matters. I came from a shop that ran almost through the entire day of stitching a jiffy steamer a stand-up handheld wand steamer sitting next to our finishing department we steamed every garment before it went out which meant removal of topping was really really easy for us steaming out topping using the rolled up ball method or these or the cigarette method that i like to call it where you roll up a tube of this the uh, water soluble right on top and it pulls out all the little bits as it gets kind of gummy and steamed up that is very easy also. It takes out hoop burn. If you have a little bit of hoop burn around the outside edge, you can take that out with that Jiffy steamer very quickly. For me, definitely used probably more topping than some people did because I had that ability to do it and it wasn't a big problem for me. Uh, didn't have materials that couldn't take the heat or take the steam. Most of the time I'm gonna use topper on anything that has a texture, anything that has deep ribs or heavy ribs, something like that, unless, Unless, let me go ahead and come, come back with one more exception. Things like knit hats, if I had adequate embroidery, embroidery behind it, if I had a full size shield, something that was going to cover, or I'm using something like knockdown stitching, light mesh fill backgrounds, underlay that's going to tame that, then I'm not worried so much about texture on things like knit hats. Uh, because I'm using a stabilization of thread to make that happen, I am putting that down, I'm preparing my surface that way. Otherwise I'm using a topper, and minimal backer stabilizer, minimal stabilizer behind the garment. That is usually my way to go. So minimal versus multiple, uh, you know, in that one, I'm definitely coming down on the minimal. So versus it's me with the minimal. We'll have to see what you guys think. But yeah, that's when I hear all the time. And what I'm going to say is, why are they doing that? Of course, 
for stability. Why do people use multiple layers? Because they're having problems with materials, they're having problems with designs. And here's the other thing that I'm going to point out. I was an in-house digitizer. If something was too heavy, if something wasn't sequenced correctly, if something was falling apart in the design, if two elements were running toward each other and it was causing a ripple to build up against something that was already done, I could change the sequence of my design. If I were in a shop and I couldn't change my designs, if I was using tons of stock design work, I can understand that if you were having problems with stabilization, you're changing different materials and it's not working, you might elect to use more stabilizer to make up for the fact that you can't get a more stable design or a design that takes your material into account. If you had to run on something light with a design that's not sequenced very well for it, that was shifting around too much, you might elect to add more stabilizer to get that done. And if we're talking in the groups about that stuff and somebody's saying, you know, I, I use more stabilizer and we're coming down on them, you may find out one of the reasons is they don't have control over part of that process because they're not using designs that they can have reworked. So it really depends, it really depends. So yeah, it is just how it is. You have to decide where do you come down and you have to think where are people coming from to make this stuff happen? So that's the first one, minimal versus multiple stabilizer. I come down the minimal squad still, I, that's how I feel about it. You may differ. Let's go ahead and grab a couple more people talking about this. Uh, Ramona says, uh, ditto, though I will use a fusible tearaway uh, uh, for a knit fabric and the cutaway to support. Yeah, for sure. Um, fusibles sometimes are the only way to get a very, um, like very unstable knit to behave. Depends on what it is. So it really depends, right? It really depends. Mike says, I vote minimal as well. One layer is fine, except action back for polos. That's a double. Absolutely. Action back every time is a double because you have to have two angles for woven stabilizers. If you use any sort of woven fabric as a stabilizer, you're going to need to have it at more than one angle, 45 degrees off of the first layer. Otherwise, you won't get stability in all dimensions. Sally says, I find if I use the right stabilizer with fabric, the one sheet's usually enough. Yeah, look at what the manufacturers recommend and give it a shot. Try it for yourself and see how it happens. Ramona says, I will use a tap topping on nap fabric and knits if the lettering is five millimeters smaller. Yes, small lettering, small detail, which was frequently something I did, uh, usually using that topper and especially unsupported detail, uh, fine stitching, light line work, stuff that's not going to do well if it falls into the grain. Mike says, sandwiches are lunch, not something to hoop. Ouch, shots fired, multiple stabilizer folks. <laughs> uh, Mike says, Ramona, me three, but I find reasons to do a sewn down field more often than not nowadays. I'm not opposed to Solvi, but I'm more fond of finding a way not to use it. Yeah. Support materials take extra time. You have to vote machine time versus material costs and material work. And as Ramona says, velvet type fabric and a heat away topper can't put water on it. Yep. Can't put water on all fabrics. Have to walk, walk through that. And Mike says, here's one of Mike's points he's going to die on. Here's his verses. Uh, speaking of steamers, a hill I'm willing to die on is to not remove a hat sticker unless you steam it off. The leftover glue stain is a major turnoff. You heard it, heard it here first. Steam versus not steam sticker. Mike says steam the sticker off. Listen to Mike. <laughs> like I said, depends on what you want. I know there's a lot of people who want that sticker to be on the hat, but if you're going to take it off, make sure it looks good. So boom, first one done. <laughs> we probably won't do as many as I thought. I thought this would be a real short show, but maybe not. A uh, couple things I'm just going to say. You, we hear this about stabilizers. If you wear it, don't tear it. That is coming often out of the home market. I'm going to say that's not always true. I'm sorry. Even though I have a tendency to use cutaways uh, instead of tearaways or anything like that, there is differences that can come up. There is a reason to use a tearaway or something else, something that doesn't stay in the, in the uh, garment for stuff that you're going to wear. If something is single color unsupported, you don't mind that it flows, that it stretches on the body, it's fine. What happens is where you want a design to hold together and it can't, or you have something super gauzy and the material can't hold up literally to the amount of embroidery you're trying to put on, you're putting a heavy embroidery on a light material, you're going to find that the disparate nature of the two, of the heavy embroidery and the light material is gonna make weirdness happen as far as like puckering and textures and all sorts of other stuff. And it's gonna pull and drag on the material and having stabilizer involved can keep that from being quite so visible. But that that rule doesn't always, you know, hold up. And yeah, as Ramona says, I preface it with the as a guideline. And here's the other thing I'm going to bring up. I'm just going to show you guys a couple things from, you know, from my showdown <laughs> setup that I have for some images. First thing is, yeah, there's some, there's definitely some different stabilizer attitudes here. But this is one that I wanted to show you guys really quickly. This is out of my retail research folder, if you want to call it that. When I'm in the shops, I check stuff out all the time. And one of the things I saw was this. Uh, 
faux chain stitch done on an incredibly light t-shirt faux chain stitch on t-shirt and i'm thinking man it looks pretty good there's not a lot of puckering going on what's going on behind this thing What's going on behind this thing is a wash away, tear away, but this is not really tear away as you would understand it. This is a tear away that leaves fiber behind. I know we talked about this on an earlier episode about stabilizer. There are stabilizers that have a portion of the material of the stabilizer being a wash away, the kind of material that would be in a complete wash away water soluble, but leave behind a small amount of fiber as you can see here and it is trapped by the embroidery itself and it does kind of hold the design so that the stitches don't get loose once the rest of it washes away. Why can we do this on this piece? Well, it was there to provide stabilization while it was running so that the the forces on the piece before um, the, while it's running, don't pull it apart during the run. We're not pulling it as we're stretching it, as we're moving around the hoop, as we are pulling the tension on the stitches. It's not pulling too much. It's not wrinkling. It's holding things nice and flat and secure. And if we look at this piece, one of the great things is it's fully connected. Uh, in and of itself, it is connected. It is one piece of thread, largely connected. It doesn't have to worry too much about stretching outside of itself. It is fairly well self-contained. It is a single color. Registration issues aren't going to matter, so it doesn't have to have a lot of stability even during the runtime. And to make this feel nice against your body, you have a light material. You have a light amount of fiber left behind, not a big cutaway chunk. And why else can we do this? This is a commercial piece that is being laundered post-decoration. We don't always have the ability to do that when we're doing this on our finished garments for embroidery. However, saying that we never, never, never do anything but something we can cut away when we're working on a t-shirt knit, is slightly disingenuous because people can go to the high street shops, to the local big box store, and they will find something like this on the rack and they'll ask you, how does this work? But what you can tell them is, this is a compromise we make and we have to launder the piece. We have to wash it away. It can't be just any design. We can't throw a big, you know, 100,000 stitch jacket back on this thing and expect this non-stabilizing stabilizer to help us keep this together. It still matters what we're doing to it, but it does mean that these things can't just be a rule. That's just one of those things. It is one of those things that we can provide as a guideline, but at the same time, it is something slightly different. Oh, New Embroiderer has a question here about stabilizers. Since we're heavy, heavily talking about stabilizer, I'll go ahead and talk about this. Um, what's Action Back? How does it differ from a medium cutaway? Uh, action Back is a woven material. It's an even weave. So we have threads going this way, threads going this way. They're woven together. It's a woven material. Why it's different is because when we have a woven material like that, though it's strong in the direction of these threads that are in the material and strong in the vertical direction, it won't stretch or pull in both of those directions. On the 45 degree, we can compress those angles and we can end up with a strange kind of look to our designs. So yeah, it, when we're dealing with action back, action back as a woven material, we want to have, since we have it like this, that grid on our initial setup, then when we add the second layer, we turn the grid 45 degrees, and then we have lines of thread. We have the warp and the, we, the weft. Um, we have that weave on vertical, horizontal, and then we have it at our 45s, so that any place we place a stitch, it's going to pull or push against something solid. So we're dimensionally stable. We're not allowing stretch. We're arresting the stretch and the motion as the design runs. So that's action back. That's why it matters to have two layers. Um, the thing is, I also know people who run two layers of action back and then throw a layer of crisp cutaway on the back to keep the edges nice. It really depends on the results you want to get and how much you care about that crispness. I don't see that it's enough for me to want to put more stabilizer on there. But if I'm using action back, two layers, because what happens with action back, you put one layer on and then you run a bunch of stitches at a high angle, you know, 30, 45 degree angle. And those stitches are pulling on the weakest angle of that stabilizer. And we get puckering and we get movement and we get pinching and uh, tension issues. Um, and I mean the tension of the stitch, not necessarily tension up and down like uh, thread tension. We get issues with uh, pulling on the garment, rippling, compression, stuff like that. So that's what I'm talking about. So yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> and by the way, I think I just saw somebody said, how do you patch a QR code? Yeah, QR codes. I digitize them manually because I'm insane like that and I don't use fill stitch stuff like that. Um, I actually digitize them manually. The reason why you're asking is I'm sure you saw that in the brand banner. And uh, we will go ahead and throw the QR code up there. You see, you'll see that, or I can actually show that on the um, graphics that I had shown here. That's probably where you saw that. This is my QR code patch done back in the original days of QR codes. So this is 
early on in the life of QR codes, very early, I made this patch manually. Uh, people were trying to make these with fill stitches, but mine is down at you know sub two inches because I did these with satin stitches and overlapped those. I digitized this like any other design. I did it very much like pixel art. And in fact, if you go back to the episode I did on pixel art, that's how you patch a QR code. I did these with individual rows of uh, satin stitches that overlapped so that we didn't have any gaps. And I accounted for pull and push compensation to keep the dots square. So yeah, I digitized it like I would any other little squares that I would want in satin stitch. The thing was, I actually have this as a versus because when I first did the QR code patch, I caught a bunch of heat for it because QR codes weren't very popular at the time, right? So yeah, definitely go check those out. You can get them down under two inches if you do them manually. Like Ramon also says, I digitized QR codes manually as small as two inches. Pixel art style is how you do it. So go check that out. But here's what I'm going to say about this. This was one of the verses. I'm going to go up ahead out of my out of my stuff that I usually do. So let's talk about marketing and business model showdowns. So what are we talking about here? Uh, that's this. That is fads versus staples. Do we engage with fads? Do I do things that are new and on the horizon? And are they worthwhile to do? And people will come down on this stuff. Like I said, I did the QR code patch really, really early. And when I did this thing and I was wearing it around, by the way, this QR code does not work anymore because the website didn't outlive the QR code. <laughs> the QR code didn't work out. And actually you'll see like Bitly, I'm using Bitly now that makes QR codes. If you notice Bitly now, will make a QR code for you. It's how I did that and how I've been doing that on all my shows. You can actually make QR codes with Bitly really easily. And in fact, by the way, this little graphic they put in the center there, I didn't tell you this, but you can go repl replace that with any graphic you want to on top of it in your uh, art software and it will indeed work. But you can make better QR codes with Vector if you want to. Uh, what I will say though is, when I first made these, people were telling me that is a fad, that is not useful, no one's ever gonna scan one of these, it's not gonna work. And what I have to admit right now, I was on the wrong side of that. I was on the wrong side of that at the time, why? Because if we go, all right, fads versus staples, at the time, it was not actually profitable. I and a few other people made them and people got excited about them. We did get a little bit of social media credit for it at the time. So you can say, yes, got some social media credit. People got some attention. Novelty can grant you some attention. Novelty can get you some action in that way. But if you put a ton of time and effort into learning a technique that's not going to hold up, it might not work out. The trick with fads and stuff like that in my opinion, fads versus staples. Uh, the trick with fads is you have to be pretty timely and you have to do it fairly quickly. When I was younger in this business, the cycle between somebody showing something in retail and us having a request for it was almost more like three to six months. The cycle now is that if someone goes to, like if Super Dry releases a new collection and they've got a different kind of embroidery than most people are doing, that day or the day after somebody says, I have a small streetwear brand. I like the way this looks. Can you do it? The cycle is really, really fast right now. Ever since the internet was ubiquitous, ever since everybody spends most of their time on social media, and it's not a weird thing that basement kids do. And yes, being a weird basement kid, I'm allowed to say that. That's our word. Uh, yeah, we are weird. We are weird, nerdy kids. This was something we did before it was cool. Now that everybody's on social media and information travels at the speed of light, the cycles are really super fast. That's just how it is. You have to catch the fad in progress, as uh, Ramona says. She's like, you have to catch the fad in progress for it to be useful if you come to it when it's already kind of played out, when it's chuggy, when no one likes it, there's nothing for it. Sometimes you get to the retro side of this thing if you are in between those two cycles. If you get too far outside of the initial cycle and not far enough for it to be something that people want to see later on down the road, that they are trying to see as you know a retro activity to put this stuff up. If it's not seen as um, something from the storied past, it is something that is passe. And it does go in cycles. When I first came into the industry, I talk about this all the time. I talked about the vintage stuff last time. When I came into the industry, a five panel trucker hat with a big square patch on it was poison. You couldn't sell a patch with a braid or with the, what we call the scrambled eggs, the uh, the, the kind of weird applied um, oak leaves on the bill. You couldn't sell that stuff if you wanted to. Now I see people putting them on as a vintage setup. They're using custom braids because they're cool. They're using those hats. And we had a cycle in between there. We had the weird like Von Dutch trucker hat cycle with flat 
uh, flat bill snapback hats lasted for a while. There have been three cycles in the flat back snap, you know, or the flat caps with the flat bill and the snapback plastic snaps, three cycles during my career alone. I came in and they were kind of fading out. They came back and then they disappeared and then they came back again as the retro, like I said before, like the seed corn farm giveaway hat trend came back and we had people like Aaron Draplin really pushing the thick line 70s, you know, bicentennial logo design style. These things come in eras. If you're not on the era or you don't find a market that likes the stuff, particularly, you won't have it. I will say this, though, just like everything else, you can have a small niche market. Even saying that we had people who still wanted that farmer hat. That's what we called it. You know, the farmer, the trucker hat in between the cycles. There were always people who still wanted them, but they weren't hot like they are when they hit as a fad. It makes me think of, you guys remember the big kind of billboard shirts? They were printed across the arms where it would be a big panel, a T panel on the shirt. The sleeves are in a separate panel and you do a big print. It was often in copper plate font on the back, single color word print on the shirt. That stuff is not hot right now the way it was when it was hitting. Are there still people making those shirts? Absolutely. Are they hot like they were when they first hit and became popular? Absolutely not. And if you didn't hit them when they were hot, learning to do that work, or let's say buying a specialty heat press to make sure you can reach across the entire back might not be as worth it today as it was when they were hot. And you can also just hit the time wrong. You can hit the time wrong. Case and point, here I am hitting the time wrong, right? I came out, brought this out. People were looking at me like I was crazy. When I had this, there were still people using feature phones and flip phones. If I would have been in Japan, somebody might have been able to read my QR code. Uh, they were not going to read it in the earliest days of the smartphone. But now, post-pandemic, I have people finding this picture and asking me to teach them to digitize this stuff. Why? Post-pandemic, when everybody was using QR codes for uh, no-touch restaurant menus, and now that phones have in the camera without going to a specific app the ability to read QR codes, now it hits. I was too early on this one by far, by many years. So it really just depends on what happens with it. It depends on what hits and what's the usefulness, right? Yeah, Suzanne says, I love those billboard shirts. I do too. Those were cool. I remember us learning those early on in the time, right? Just depends. Just depends. Um, Mike says, a lot of era stuff is considered a fab, but never really went anywhere. Just got to wait for every new generation to finally pick up on it. Yeah. How many bell-bottom pants are we going to see? I, I'm sure we're due for another one anytime soon. It just happens that way. Things come and go in cycles, but you don't know what's going to hit and you don't know what's going to work out. Uh, one man's trash, another man's dead stock, new in box. We know this is how that stuff works, folks. So there you go. And Sally says, why would you want to digitize a QR code? Because people ask you to, because it's a commercial world. And also, why did I do it? Uh, I was doing it because I was using it as a business card. And it was novel at the time for, I'd say, somebody point your camera at my sleeve and it was my business card. The latest one I did of this is my LinkedIn profile. If you wanted to talk to me, I didn't have to put up a business card and like take a picture of my sleeve. You'll get it later. And they were able to link directly to my information. So QR code can be fun, but it is totally something different. Ramona says, laugh, I'm still doing flares, but I'm old. Hey, I'm old too. Like I said, when I found out that... Uh, my old grunge era gear was worth money for some people. I was sad. <laughs> These things happen. But yeah, it just depends. Uh, a lot of that stuff, you never know. Uh, Meet Merp, by the way, I love the username. I'm going to say that a few times. Uh, NFTs are a huge market for QR codes. I've been asked so many times. I'm so excited to learn this. Yeah, hey, hit me up. I can also share that image with you. But check out the Pixel Art episode and I talk about it. I believe I actually show you a QR code and show you some of the ways that I overlap those stitches to make them work. Check it out on the Pixel Art episode. Search on the YouTube channel. It's the easiest way to, for you to find it. Uh, you're already on YouTube. You should be able to check it out in the search on my channel. Yeah, QR code. So yeah, fad versus staples. I'll come down on this. If I want to give the, why not? I'll give you my vote on this one. Always learn the staples. They're not likely to go anywhere. Patches are great. Hats are great. Left chest designs are great. They're going to be on a lot of stuff. There's no reason not to learn those and be ready to make those and have the equipment to do those, no matter what kind of embroidery you do. It's worthwhile to know how to do them if you are going to be an overall kind of supplier. Um, fads, 
if you can hit it, if you see something cool, try it out. Why not? It's something that I've talked about actually twice today on other shows that I've been either hosting or being on. Uh, I like 20% time like Google does. I'm not saying 20% is the right amount of time, but we should spend some portion of time experimenting, working on our business, learning new techniques, trying something interesting. Try something interesting. If it's something that's in that fad realm, why not show that work? You don't know who wants that work uh, until you show it. What I will say, though, is just get out there, show it, throw things against the wall. It's totally fine commit to losing a little bit of time to that development work. And some of it can totally be, let's try the new fad and see how it turns out. Uh, you don't know what might be a business center for you. I've certainly come across things, like I said, patches and emblems for us, in-house small run patches were never a thing we intended to do at, at my shops that I worked at the longest. However, ended up doing a few, uh, saying yes to those jobs for traditional reasons. We did those, but then we outsourced them. We ended up doing small run in-house for TV and film and then made a lot of money doing not only TV and film patches for uh, for wardrobe, you know, for prop, you know, on-screen usage for props, but ended up doing tons of wrap gifts and crew gear and everything else that surrounds it because we said yes to the creative kind of crazy stuff that might have been considered kind of fad work or work that was less profitable. You don't know where stuff's going to lead, so you need to allow yourself some leeway. I know we talk about profit and making sure people pay for those limited hours of your life that you're spending, but at the same time, it's worthwhile to try something different once in a while. All right, so do staples, but try fads. Why not? Try new things, play with them, show them, and see where that work relies. And also, here's the thing. It can become a reliable stream. And if you see a need for it, that's the other thing too. If you are in your niche, you know your audience, and you see a need for a kind of work, try and do it. If you see the need, you really believe in it, especially if you know the niche well, you're part of the niche market that you're working toward, by all means, if you see a need, try to fill that need. That is design thinking. That is the way we make new things happen. You got to try new stuff once in a while. It can't always be recycling old staples. However, foundational knowledge is important. You need to have the foundations both technically and in your offerings to be able to kind of get the market all together. Unless you're focusing on one particular niche. I know folks who do just one thing. Hey, Matt, who's on there, does just patches and does them well. That is a skill. If you're doing something that is of use to people and you are specializing in it and doing a great job, uh, that can be the thing that sells you because people come to you for your specialty. So I'll actually go ahead and say a couple more business model things to do them real fast. Niche versus overall. Niche marketing is easier for you to do your marketing because it's something you can sell into if you know the niche really well. It means you can limit your scope. That's awesome. However, overall means that you have the ability to take on any customer. What I'm going to say is it's way harder to stand out when you're overall than it is when you're doing niche work. Niche work allows you to apply to an underserved market. Underserved markets often are looking to spend on things they're not even aware that they can get services. When you start presenting services to them that they don't know are possible, they are grateful and they have a tendency to buy in a little easier. So niche versus overall, both. Do both if you can, if it makes sense for your business. But I say niche marketing is great for people who are not feeling great about selling and it can help you get over the hump. So niche versus overall, I say both. Depends on where you're going for it. What I will say is trying to be everything to everybody with no specialty at all will mean that you don't stand out. So even if you're an overall decorator doing stuff for all kinds of different markets, you need to have certain things you're great at, certain niches that you can apply to, or certain technical skills, certain kinds of things you do and show that help you stand out from the crowd. So niche versus overall. Also, in that same kind of thing, single decoration versus one-stop shop. The shops that I worked at were multi-deck shops. They were not single decoration shops. I will say, though, that that meant we often got our hands into a lot of different things, and certain things that we did were not our core work, and we didn't do them as well. To the point that later on in the life of those shops, some of the things we originally did, including stuff like wide format printing, we eventually left behind. When there was an equipment failure, we ended up going with our outsourcer permanently because it wasn't in our wheelhouse. You have to look for how much exposure makes sense to you. Or here's the thing. Depending on your market, if you are somebody who is in a small town and nobody is servicing locally, being the one-stop shop might be the best way because people don't really have another place to go. If they can do all of the things that are promotional products or decorated products and accessories in one spot, you're more likely to pick up their work and you might be the only game in town. Makes a lot of sense for you to be a one-stop shop doing small run stuff in your own shop entirely rather than doing a ton of outsourcing. If your ecosystem supports outsourcing without hurting the client, awesome. 
build your dream team, do single decoration, or do the amount of exposure you feel good about that is in your core. If you're somewhere where you have a need in your local market and it makes sense to be a one-stop shop, be the one-stop shop. It all depends on where you come from. I will say this, as someone who's worked in a one-stop shop, I myself have helped put graphics on the side of a SWAT team vehicle. That was not the thing I needed to be doing that day. I would have been better used as an embroidery expert. Did I do okay? Yeah, looked good to me. I did a pretty good job on the vector when we cut it. It doesn't mean that it was something I probably should have been doing or was the most profitable job we took on. We serviced that job to keep that person in-house and to provide them with uh, kind of a courtesy so they didn't have to go to a bunch of different places with the same graphic they were using for multiple types of decoration. Does that mean it's always the way to do it? No, not always the way to do it. It can go either way. I say watch your exposure, do things that make sense to you, and don't just do everything for the sake of doing everything. Do it when it makes sense to serve a market. So there's that. So those are my big ones for uh, marketing versus business model. Uh, a couple other ones I wanted to cover very briefly back in the stabilizer showdown couple of ones here um when we're talking about structured caps this is one that i kind of get on the bad side of for this one it actually is a versus battle sometimes uh stabilizer versus none in a structured hat i'm just going to come down on my side of this one i use stabilizer on structured hats and this is from experience this may not be experience for everyone but this is the thing from experience on the equipment i used i have had hats hang up on the needle plate, hang up on obstructions, especially if I'm trying to push into certain areas of the hat where I might be running the hat really close to the corners of the needle plate. And once again, depends on your equipment or how your equipment's put together. Uh, and in that process, extra friction and hanging up ended up with um, issues with, with kind of uh, stabilization, issues with everything staying in register, uh, issues with things slipping past different parts of the equipment. And in that case, using a stabilizer on the structured hat meant that seams and other protrusions from the back of the hat didn't catch on anything. And it was just a way to remove failures from our process. This is something I learned on the job on a specific set of machines. It may not be the same for you. However, I have a tendency to feel like one piece of caps tearaway stabilizer in the back of a structured hat makes things run smoothly and I'm happier with the thing when I get done with it. Not everybody loves it. So this is something people fight with. They say, man, you're spending too much money on that stuff. Why are you putting stabilizer? It's an extra two process you don't need on a structured hat. For me, I found it makes a difference to me and I ended up on the stabilizer crew for structured hats. I use stabilizer and structured hats. You don't have to. So in the versus battle for me, structured caps get stabilizer. That's how I do it. So it just depends on how you feel about it. That's my big one for stabilizer on that one. And I'll leave the stabilizers out of it. Let's get a couple comments before we kind of go through our last few rapid fire ones. I won't keep you guys too long today. We can always do another versus battle show if you want to. I'd love to even have some of you guys on at some point to talk about this stuff. And I definitely want to hear more of your opinions. But let's grab a couple comments before we get done. All right. So a couple of them. Matt does patches. Like I said, he does patches and he loves patches and he does them well. Patchphrase.com. Go check them out. If you do something really well, keep doing it. And if you do it the best, and if you are part of the niche, you can speak the right language to get people to buy. That is the way to do it and to serve their needs. What are we here to do? We're here to help people. We're here to make them have a good time. Ramona says, niche, but be available for, to someone from outside the niche. Yeah, good way to go. Push yourself in niche marketing. Keep your mind open. Keep your eyes open for opportunity. That is the way to do it. Uh, Sally says, niche for me, yeah. Like I said, a lot of people love niche marketing. I think it works very well. And like I said, you do the niche well. I've seen people do so well in certain niches. Uh, big one, bridal. Great profitability in the bridal market if you do it right. If you get really good at running on the kinds of materials that the bridal market wants, you can absolutely charge a mint. I'm not saying you should do things in an inappropriate way, but you can make real money. That's how it goes. It's really how it goes. So it depends on how it works for you, but go for it. Uh, niche is fantastic. Nikki says hello. Hello, Nikki. Sassy all day long. <laughs> Got to get in there. Leanne says specialized one-offs. I love doing, but staples pay the bills. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Matt says, if you make this, I will tag you on my Instagram. <laughs> hey, watch how many followers they have. You never know. You never know. Sometimes it can turn into something. What I'll say is if it's something you're worried about not being profitable, try and make it profitable. And at the very least, only do stuff that 
actually enriches you and teaches you something in that 20% time. Don't just take on jobs for friends unless you really, really like them. Make sure that anything you take on as a job for a friend is something you can afford giving away. And I'm going to say something controversial here. Here's another big versus battle. If someone is your friend and wants you to succeed, wouldn't they want to pay you for your work so that your job goes well and so that your business is still here in six months? Hey, not trying to say it, but I'm trying to say it. <laughs> People who always beg for free stuff might not want you to be that successful. <laughs> All right. Uh, Suzanne says, dropped off half of a large order for a downtown store. Normal gray, black, red, and navy hoodies included one dozen light blue. Went back today, dropped off the rest. They had sold out of light blue and ordered more. Sometimes a new color helps. Absolutely. Offering something a little extra, especially if you have the possibility for it and it's not going to hurt you, uh, it can help. I know one of the things we did pretty frequently, if I found a design that would, and it is rare that they do, if I found a design that would work on a hat without a ton of work, especially something where I could very quickly resequence something and the customer had only ever ordered flats with us, or let's say they're only or ordered uh, a certain kind of outerwear and I had some dead stock, I had something that I could use that was ordered for something else that I couldn't return in time, throw in a hat throw in a bag, throw in something they weren't expecting with their logo on it, not yours, their logo, because it's a present for them, not for you. And make sure your, your contact information is inside of that new garment. And it is surprising how many times that order will come back with a set of those as well. You know, don't give away the farm, but give away something once in a while. You never know. It's all about promoting that novelty, making sure they know it's possible. The sad thing is, and this is what I always do. You guys have heard me do this in a class. You've been around me for very long. I always pretend to whisper. I'm like, all right, are there any customers here? Customers have no idea what they want. Uh, yeah, they don't know new stuff. They don't know anything more than what they intended to come in for. They're not usually shopping. They're there to have you solve a problem. Provide them, consult them, be a consultant, not a commodity. Show them new, interesting things and show them what it is. Show them what's going on. Explain to them the value. Give them an idea of what's possible. They don't know the possibilities, either creatively or in the market of what they're trying to purchase outside of what they already intended to come in with. It's rare that you have a customer come in, well, in my opinion, and hey, in my experience, right? We talked about that coming from different experiences. It was rare to have a customer come in and just look around our shop and go, well, I know I want something embroidered. I just don't know what. They came in for hats. They came in for jackets. They came in for shirts. But the customers don't always know the world that's out there. And we are the experts. We are surrounded by it day in, day out. And you're the kind of people who listen to me talk for an hour and a half about embroidery. You know stuff they don't know and you need to share it. All right. So there's where we go. All right. Uh, Ramona says, hat stabilizer. Yes, I believe so too. And here's where Mike and I are talking about something that we do, something slightly different sometimes. Structured hat stabilizer. Yes. Full wrap post to post though. Nope. Only on an obstinate, unagreeable design. Enough is enough in my shop. All right, I'll give you this. I usually do more post to post than uh, Mike does, but I'm going to tell you why. I often do post to post because I often did off center or side placements. Lots of the stuff I was doing was side placement. And once we're past the structured part here, we've got nothing down the sides. We need to have something there. So yeah, on a full front, you know what my favorite frames ever were? I used to have the old school heavy tooth front panel only, uh, um, the front panel only hat frames. I just lost the name for some reason. My head just lost it. Hoopmasters. I had Hoopmaster, I think probably Gen 2s, that had the big handle-like uh, protrusion on the front, and you had teeth that were holding the front panel, and you only had the front panel decoratable in those frames. Those were my favorites, because when you're just running front panel designs, I only want to stabilize the front panel. I want it to be very, very stable. There is no reason for me to stabilize the sides. But when I have to start running side stuff, side text, or stuff that goes over the seams, which was increasingly what I did, especially toward kind of the end of the commercial decoration part of my career. And I hate to say that. That makes me feel sad. But before I was doing more development, digitizing, and teaching, uh, I ran a lot of stuff off the side of that front panel, tons of it. And running off the front panel onto the unstabilized, non-crown portion of the, of the hat absolutely requires you to have something underneath it to hold it up during the design, especially when you have heavy designs that are supposed to cross over into the side and still maintain the same sort of registration. That's where you do full wrap post to post. You see me talking about full wrap post to post. You're talking to somebody who did a bunch of stuff on the 270s and went around the sides. And that's often how it goes. So side designs, uh, when they go over the side like that, yeah, you kind of have to do the full wrap to make them work the best. And I agree, but I'll say this. My favorite kind of way to do a side design, uh, standard hooping on the side separate. 
or doing it entirely on the side separate on the hat, not as the same part of design. And I'll actually go back to Mike because he's in there too. Ah, in our shop, we treat side design as a second placement and a whole other hooping. So it's a choice we've made that drives the stabilizer decision. It's all about choices. This is what I'm talking about. Everybody comes with their own baggage to the discussion. We all have the way we do stuff. My baggage is tons of designs that were going over the crown off to the sides. Lots of them. If you see my samples of hats that I show, I had a lot of designs that were off this off of the front panel or that were uh, front lower designs that we ran the second portion as one design. I don't love running full 270s. I'm not about going from one ear to the other ear. I don't love those designs. They're hard to keep stable. And I don't love doing three placements in one file often. I'm more like you, Mike. If we're doing just a true side placement, I usually want to run that separately and I will load those up separately in the uh, software. I usually won't have that one big design that travels from one side to the next. I don't find it stable enough for me. So I'm kind of with you, honestly. We're a little bit on the same page, but I did a ton of designs. There's an entire period of time where the center of the design was somewhere off to one side and we had wings, text, something else into the front of the hat, into the back of the hat, off of the stabilized area in the crown. Totally true. So that's how it is. All right. Sally says, I totally agree. Most customers are easily impressed if you can show them a few samples, something they've not thought of. This is where the art stuff gets in sometimes. Sometimes you show them the art and they still go, wow, that's amazing. That's impressive. I love it. How much does it cost? Cool. Can I just get a left chest single color on your shirt? They look at your samples and they still order the staples. But sometimes them trusting you encourage, is encouraged by the fact that you can do crazy custom interesting work and when they get the occasion to do crazy custom interesting work they come to you because you can do it nikki says i feel niche markets tend to show more of the heart than having everything in your wheelhouse yeah that's the truth i think you can be a commodity if you're doing everything for everybody you can be a commodity the problem is any website with online decoration capability can take a logo and put it on a garment in a place if you're doing something in a niche and you're offering a certain kind of garment with a certain kind of usage to a clientele for whom that works and the decorations make sense that shows heart that does it shows knowledge and you're an insider and you speak the language that's why i do often like the niche market so i'm gonna go rapid fire through a few more of these things i wanted to talk about we talked about uh essentially we talked a little bit about the stabilizer side of it but let's do quick hooping showdown so what are our big versus things today what is it that's versus on these hooping showdown First one, adhesive versus specialty fixtures. If we're doing things like belts, bands, straps, collar tips, stuff like that, do we go and get clamps or do we just stick it down to a piece of stabilizer? For me, this is not really a versus. This is what is your specialty? If I were working in the pet industry and doing collars all day long, you better believe that I'd have a strap jig built up so I wasn't just sticking things down unless I found that the results were better. I'd probably have something specific to doing it. If I was doing name tapes all day long, you can believe that I'd have a specialty name tape jig if I could, because I want things to be as easy and repeatable as they can be. However, if the quality is better with adhesives, you'd better know that I'm going to be using adhesives on that stuff for sure. Like I said, that is what I would be thinking about. Quality has to be there, but if I can make it more efficient, make it more efficient. So adhesive versus fixture to me, Hey, stick it down if you need to. If you're doing one piece out of nowhere, absolutely stick it down and don't worry about it. But otherwise, yeah, fixture if I need it, fixture if I'm going to do it forever. If all I do are, are big flaps on bags, I'm going to get a pneumatic clamp or something that will hold them that I can repeat and stick down fast. And I'm not going to necessarily do traditional hooping if it's a pain. So adhesive versus fixture, whatever you have to do to make it work. If you're doing a couple pieces of adhesive, when you start getting into mass amounts of one kind of thing that needs a specialty fixture, why would you not look at the a money involved and what you can do to make it happen. So yeah, adhesive versus fixture, go for it. If you need the fixture and you can do that, it's in your wheelhouse, why would you not? But what, there's nothing wrong with stitching some, stitching an area down, putting some guidelines in, sticking down a collar tip and you know running that across the tearaway. That is how we do weird stuff that doesn't fit in a hoop. It's just the way it is. And in fact, I'm gonna go ahead and put this up there because this is more in the home market, but I know this fight has happened before. Hoop versus float. What does this mean? Do you hoop something entirely or do you float it over the top and stick it down or baste it down or stitch it down? I am solidly in the hoop camp because the hoop is there to arrest the fabric from moving, stretching, or rippling or puckering. Can you stick it down in a way that works with floating? Sure. Uh, will you avoid hoop burns? Sure. However, what I'm going to tell you is 
if I have a thing that cannot hoop correctly, the likelihood is I'm going to float it. I'm going to stick it down. It's all about results. And in fact, I'll show you a version of this. This is a me floating something right here. So here's, and this is, I showed it on a home machine to show you guys that yes, indeed, I know what I'm talking about. I do have run sometimes on little home machines to describe this stuff. This is a piece of adhesive stabilizer. I've peeled away a window in the adhesive stabilizer. I stuck down the edge of this uh, t-shirt sleeve. Why did I do that? Because I wanted to get the design. This is the eventual design. And I wanted to put it right up to the edge of this where the hoop wasn't going to hold it all that well. And I decided to stick it down because it was just as easy for a single color light density piece. It wasn't going to take me any time to do it. Whereas if I was trying to use a really tiny hoop and get down into the corner, to be honest with you, the tiny hoops, if they're traditional hoops, not magnetic, and let's get, get that straight. If it's a traditional hoop and not magnetic, going over this seam that you can see here can cause it to have different amounts of tension in parts of the hoop, and it would still slip a little bit. Stick the sucker down. It's only one color. I'm not going to tear up that tear away uh, too far before I end up running something else. I'm not dealing with seven colors where there's going to be registration errors as the stabilizer gets chewed up by the process. Why would I not stick that down and get really, really close to the edge? And like I said, many times in my career, uh, collar tips, small straps on things, the straps on the back of Velcro strap hats, I have stitched a line, stuck them down, run the design, and that is essentially the same as, as floating, except for it's in the case of using that instead of a fixture. So do the thing. You know, the hoop for me is there to arrest that movement in the design or in the fabric while the design is running. That's why we use hoops. That's why they've been around since, you know, the inception of embroidery. Hoops make sense. They do a job. However, when you have to float something to make it fit, you're working on a bag with zippers and straps and fixtures all over the place. Stick it down, sew it down, baste it down, and get the needle through it. That's what has to happen for those pieces to get done. Or better yet, stick a patch to it and sew that down on your post bed machine if you got one. Heck, you know, do what you have to do to get the job done. But most of the time, I'm going to hoop because I'm about arresting that movement. That's just what it is. When hooping's not an option, we don't hoop. And I, that's what I'm saying. Like, and also making fixtures is totally a thing. We used to make all of our hooping fixtures before the era of awesome stuff like Hoop Master, where we have repeatable fixtures that are easily made. We built all of our own shirt boards, our own hoop boards. We would build places where the spectacle frames would fit and we would peg them into those shirt boards ourselves. Building fixtures as possible, including building fixtures for the machine. And in fact, Tom says that, and I love that. I have always made my own fixtures until I have enough business to purchase one. Absolutely, I see people doing it. And in an era where we now have uh, commercially available and often used in the same decoration shop, um, laser cutters or 3D printers, or both, we have a lot of options for making fixtures and guides and rulers to help us do our work. So absolutely. That's how I feel about that. Uh, hoops. And by the way, there's another one, magnetic hoops. That was another thing I was going to put up there. And I think this isn't, isn't really a fight either. Magnetic versus standard hoops. Hey, if you've got the cash to go magnetic, I love them. There are some drawbacks sometimes and I can't, you can't use them for just everything, but they work for most stuff and they have really even pressure. What I love about them, we can have a square field and we don't get those loose sides because on, on a standard hoop that's rectangular, you get tight corners and loose sides and you don't have as much pressure. You don't have as much holding power on the sides as you do in the corners. For those, I really prefer the magnetic hoop because we've got every place where there is a pair of magnets, we are going to hold down that material and it's going to arrest it. What's the name of the game for hoops? Arresting stretch, arresting motion in the material. That's why hoops are there to hold the area as still as it needs to be. It doesn't have to be stretched to the nth degree, but we're trying to isolate the area that's embroiderable that we're working on. And in fact, that's why you use a smaller hoop for a smaller design if you can. Smallest hoop that fits is going to give you the best stability when you run. So magnetic versus standard. Hey, magnetic if you can get them, standard if you got them. And what I'll even say about that, hoops versus fixtures and stuff like that, when we were doing things like catbacks, this is one of the, that I brought up where people talk to me you know, constantly about what do you do for catbacks? And this is what people are doing now, and I love them. This is actually a stocking in a catback design, or you can use in a catback frame. This is a catback clamp. These are awesome. They allow you to access a lot of space in the back of the cap. They're meant to clap down quickly and securely on the back of the hat and allows you to decorate a large area. Nothing wrong with this. What did we start out on? Here we are, standard old school green Tajima 12 centimeter hoop. 
flatten that thing down with a piece of tearaway. Is it perfect? No. Does it make it work fine enough to put a small piece of text or a small bug logo on the back of one of these hats? Absolutely, you can do it. We used to hoop them flat, straighten them up as best we could to the kind of guideline of the arms on tubular hoops and run. And we ran thousands and thousands of hats like this. You use what you have. If you can get better, when somebody releases something like this, if you have the money and you have the market, very much like Tom said, you got the market, you're doing tons of hat backs and it makes sense. Or you're lucky enough to figure out a couple different markets, like whoever decided to uh, throw what is actually, very honestly, a pottery barn embroidered, <laughs> um, a pottery barn embroidered stocking. I can tell you from the font uh, into a hoop like this. You want to start doing stocking tops as well as hat backs. Hey, get the fixture if it expands your business. Think about the business, think about the market, and use the fixture when you can. But absolutely, can you do it old school? You can do it old school. Do it any way that makes sense for you. Uh, and also, you can see we have a center mark that we've marked on this on this uh, frame. It was very obviously made for us to set this up for small positions. But I will say, we could not access nearly the amount of space that you can access on that cap back frame. So this clamp is going to give you a lot more access, and you can also leave your hat, your, your machines up on hats. We're still on the cylindrical uh, frame here, so we don't have to switch the machine off or be switching between machines to do this method. So there's lots of reasons why you do it. What do we think about? We think about efficiency. We think about what makes sense for the job. We think about what makes sense for our market. So last couple things on here, uh, essentially, I'm going to leave the last bits out. Maybe we'll do a digitizing versus later because we're at almost an hour and a half. I think we've done the job. I think we've said the things we needed to say, but I will go ahead and grab a couple comments before we finish this out. I'll just kind of wrap this up with my thoughts about these kind of uh, cyclical embroidery fights that we have about these things. Let's go ahead and grab the couple of comments that we have here. Uh, Ramona says, mag hoop takes the place of fixture for me. Yeah, magnetic hoops are pretty good because of the tension they hold all around the sides. I've seen people put straps and stuff in magnetic hoops pretty regularly because they'll still hold a fair amount of tension on something even when it's kind of loose inside the hoop and you don't have an even hooping. So I've seen people do it. Uh, yeah, it can sometimes take the place of the fixture or, and take the place of sticking stuff down. So magnetic hoops are awesome. They have a lot of great tension all the way around. Um, yeah, hoop. If you can hoop it, hoop it. The idea of the hoops hold fabric. Absolutely. I am in that camp. I'm a hooper, not a floater. But that doesn't mean that you can't float when it's necessary. And Sally says, I've successfully floated a few, quite a few things, and hooping really wasn't an option for various reasons. Absolutely. Stuff's in the way. You can't get a hoop to clamp, then it's not going to do its job. The job is to get stability in the embroidery, and results are what matter, right? Ramona says, I tell people about boats on the lake. No anchor and the boat floats away. If you hoop, you're trying to tie the dock at all four corners. Yeah. That's the thing. It's all about stability. It's all the way, the way it's going to be. And Sally says, about to say magnetic if you can afford them. Absolutely. I'm still planning what I need, want, can afford my upgrade from my single needle to multi-needle soon. Yes, absolutely. I think that uh, magnetic hoops are great when you can get them. Love the stuff from Hoopmaster. Um, magnetic hoops, hooping jigs for repeatable hooping in the same areas. Does it mean you have to have a jig to use them? Absolutely, it does not. Having a jig is great when you can. When you can afford it, when the market will bear it for you, when your market makes sense to have something, the things that increase your efficiency and reduce the amount of time you take and set up, they leave that time available for something else. Either you can run more designs, you can run more work, literally embroider more, or you have more development time or more time to sell, more time to run your business, more time to market. All of these things are good, but there is a cost. It's about balancing the cost and understanding the opportunities that are out there. So yeah, love that stuff. Uh, Lena says, top info, Eric. Thanks again. Thank you for being here, Lena. Happy to have you in. And Leanne says, thanks. First time viewer. I'll be back 27 years in the industry. You still learn. Absolutely. I've been in it for quite some time too. You know, late, late nineties is when I came in and I'm still learning things every day. And I still do testing and work and studying all the time. There's a part of development in every one of my weeks. And I think it should be the same for you. So last couple of things. If you want to check out that article that I talked about earlier, once again, uh, bit.ly slash H-U-M-C-H-A-R. That is going to give you the principle of charity and the principle of humanity. Principle of charity, take the most favorable view of your opponent's argument and argue against that, not against the crazy conspiracy version of their views. Take something that's the most believable version of their argument before you fight against it. Principle of humanity, assume that they are fighting for or making an argument from a rational place and that if you were in the same position as them with the same experience they have 
that you would possibly feel the same way they do. Start with these two principles in any argument, even if it's something as immaterial and unimportant as cutaway versus tearaway, and you're going to have a better time of your arguments. Once again, because I, I'm trying this out new today and new in the other shows, if you want to see that article one more time, pause now, grab that thing on your phone, hit the QR code, and you can read that article at your leisure. Last thing on this one, remember, once again, guys, results matter. Nothing else matters, unfortunately, <laughs> sometimes, because we get ourselves worked up about the process. It matters how you feel about the process. It matters about trusting your process and that you can trust your materials and your methods. However, in the end, if you kind of take a wander around and do a little bit different method to get somewhere, it's about the results, though I am going to say the results include when it's in business, profitability, when it's for yourself, whether or not you express yourself in the way you wanted to and your results on the machine, and whether or not you are sane and happy and healthy at the end of the process. Results matter. How you get there can change and different ways will get you there. Like I said, uh, we come down in different places. We have different reasons why we decide on things. No matter what kind of shop you are, no matter how you get to your results, make sure that you're treating yourself with a little bit of charity, a little bit of grace, and keeping your own humanity while you think about the charitable version of, and the humanity of the people with whom you fight. And by all means, it might be fun to have our versus matches and our knockdown drag out battles about how we do things. But ultimately, we're all in the same business together. Help embroidery get better by helping your work get better and showing the best version of your work and yourself and everything you do. All right, folks. And I agree with Mike here. We'll have to repeat this topic. This could be a regular returning talk. I cannot wait to put that versus graphic up more times. I can't help myself. I almost put uh, en like fight energy bars. This thing almost looked like Street Fighter 2 if I would have had a little more time this week. But yeah, <laughs> we'll probably have the versus battle again, especially if we can come with some. I have some definite versus battle stuff for digitizing. So digitizing versus battle, watch out for it. It's coming. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, folks, everybody's got a side. And honestly, most of us are all trying to get to the same place. Let's help each other along and certainly give yourself some grace and some space as you get to your results this week. And you know, screen's always lying. It's nothing till it hits stitches, but you're going to get there if you try. And the best thing you can do is spend some time developing and making sure that you keep your mind open, keep your heart open as you discuss these things. And that's the best way you're going to learn. Keep that beginner mindset and learn every day. All right, folks, until next week, I cannot wait to see you again, even if we sometimes have a little bit of a versus battle.